Good morning. Welcome to each one. Good morning. I hope this morning my goal is to... Nevin prayed that, uh, for a message that I prepared, and it's not from me, but it's from the Word of God, I hope. And I hope that it can be something that stirs your thinking, stirs, stirs your mind, and also conversation beyond today and this, this morning. So we're going to be looking at the book of 1 John, uh, chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 10 of chapter 1. 1. And it's, it's an interesting context, and I think it's a very interesting book to study as I looked into it. And I'm curious how many of you have memorized chapter 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard. Okay, good, all right. So, so I want to, big picture here, what was John doing? It was assumed many people think that it was John, Apostle John, the John that was with Jesus, the disciple, that wrote this book. And he wrote it sometime after Jesus passed away. And so the, they were, the, the church was almost being overwhelmed by false teaching and things that were bombarding the truth. The church was feeling that erosion. So, so John was writing to the churches that were within his influence and telling them something that they already knew, but kind of confirming what they had known and believed and seen. But first of all, we, uh, I want to I talk about the voices that are available to us. We have, as a congregation, through the internet, through our phones, through whatever it is, we have a lot of access. And through that access comes voices, right? We have apps, websites that track cookies, algorithms that are, that are feeding us things that we love to hear, that we like to see, and it, and it feeds those things to us. So without the context of community, a congregation of people, we can kind of grow up in a silo and learn things that we think are truth when actually there is error associated with maybe a half-truth. Um, so there was a young man that I know very well who was latched on. He was taught a theology that was false. It was, it was not true, and especially as it relates to boundaries with other people, uh, especially interacting with the opposite gender. So he latched on to this because it made sense to him with, with his alignment in life. He aligned with it, but also how he thought he saw the world. It, it kind of made sense, and so he bought into it, but not knowing that it would take him step by step to a place that he never realized he would actually be. Once he got to that place, he realized this something is false here. Something that I was taught is not true. And so he changed course, and the false teaching had to be pointed out from the truth from the Word of God. I assume all of us have probably experienced to some degree, we, we, we've, we've heard somebody say something, maybe about the Bible, about Scripture, maybe about the Gospel, that it, it didn't quite settle right, but we didn't know what was wrong with it. What is wrong? We couldn't identify the falsehood in, in the teaching. And so my encouragement this morning is going to be to know the truth. Some of the things that the church was facing back here, again now in the historical context, they were asking questions whether or not Jesus' body was real. Was he on earth? Was it an illusion or was he actually real? How could he be fully human and be God. Like, he was probably sent maybe from God, but a lesser God. How would he feel the pain of the crucifixion? How could he feel that? These were things that the church was wrestling with and people were wrestling with. It's called docetism as well as Gnosticism. We've probably heard that word some months ago uh, with the creeds. So John was 
addressing the churches. He wanted to encourage them to remain faithful while also confronting the false teachings and offer assurance of salvation. He also wanted to declare Christ's full humanity and divinity. That's actually a big key in our Christian faith. All right, if you have memorized this, I have it in the King James Version here. You can say it with me, follow along, or we'll say it all together. But I want you to notice how, it, how John writes this. Who is it from? Who is it for? And then notice the, the verbs, the action verbs that are used here. All right, let's start from the beginning. That which was from the beginning. Who is it talking about? Who's that? Jesus. Okay. So remember, this is in the context of, of false teachings, right? Let's go ahead. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the word of was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Amen. All right, I want some feedback. What are the action verbs that you're seeing in verses 1 and 2? Go ahead and say them. Okay, and, and let's do the whole verb. I forget what the phrase. Have heard. Have seen. Have looked. Have handled. Verse 2. Have seen. Bear witness. Show unto you was manifested. What tense is all this stuff in? What tense is he writing it? Past. So it's already happened. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard. Who is we? Why is he saying you have heard or I have heard? He's saying it as a collective group. He's not separating us versus them. So he's actually writing it to a congregation people, churches that were within his influence that had experienced these things. We have heard, we have seen, we have looked upon. They are doing those things, that which was from the beginning. We have heard Jesus. We have seen him with our eyes. We have looked upon him. We have touched him. Concerning the word of life. John is on the same level. The writer is on the same level as they are. So he establishes something right at the beginning. A lot of Paul's letters that he has written in the New Testament start out with greetings or, or some salutation greeting the people. John goes right in, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard. He's addressing kind of the core... Um, foundational misunderstanding that a lot of people had, some people were experiencing, were wavering on. So Jesus was from the beginning, and he was real. I want to
point out a few verses here. First of all, it goes back to Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God, it starts with God. God created the heaven and the earth. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was what? The Word. And the Word was with God and the Word. So who was in the beginning with, at the beginning when God created the heaven and the earth? Jesus. Okay. Micah 5.2. This is when Micah announced uh, that Bethlehem was to be the birthplace of the Messiah. He said, whose going forth has been from old, from everlasting. Colossians 1.17. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. Apostle Paul tells Timothy that God was manifest in the flesh. And then Jesus himself told Philip, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. So John is saying unequivocally, Jesus is real. And he always was. What is the key word as you look at verse 3? What is the key theme that you are seeing in this verse? Maybe one word. So John writes, That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. I'm reading out of ESV now. So that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. What is a theme that we are seeing in verse 3? Fellowship, yeah. And if you'll notice in this verse, he's actually making now a comparison. He says, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you, there's some separation here now, so that you may have fellowship with us. And he's saying, and indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. So that could have been speaking to all of them or the ones maybe who were wavering, who had some doubts. So I want to look at what limits fellowship with God. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Ephesians 5, 11 to 14. Let no man deceive you with vain words. They were actually kind of experiencing something similar to this, right? For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. In parentheses, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And let's say the last phrase together. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. What limits fellowship with God? Darkness. God is light, as we will see as we continue. Fellowship with God is agreement. But not only agreement, it's a heart of obedience to Him in all things. If you think of a partnership here in this world where you're the minority owner, maybe, you have goals and you have a direction where you're headed, but you as the minority owner decide you're going to make other decisions do things differently, what is going to happen with that partnership? It's, it's going to be cut off. It's going to die. It's not going to work. We cannot have fellowship or partnership with God if we are misaligned with His heart. Verse 4, And we write these things 
so that our joy may be complete. So, rather than telling the people to be upset about the false teaching and the people that were leaving the church, he said, here's the truth. Have joy that you know that this is your salvation, the certainty of your faith. This is it. Christ was from the beginning. He is real. He offers salvation. Verse 5 moves on the message that we have heard of Him and proclaim to you. This was the message from Jesus. God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. Now, we could go into this quite a bit, and I'm not going to today, but we've often heard that light and darkness cannot coexist. And here it says, God is light. There's no darkness at all in Him. So the the Bible talks about it. Can the children of light and the children of darkness have communion, have fellowship together with each other? And we know the answer is simply no, there is not. Light and darkness do not coexist. So now, here's more of a hypothetical, right? If we say that we have fellowship with Him, But while we walk in darkness, we're liars. We lie. We do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have, there's the theme again, theme word. What is it? Fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, John goes on in verses 8 through 10, talking about the danger of denying sin. So give me the response. I say I have no sin. I am a liar. Do you know of any other verses that might talk about this? If I say I have no sin, like what, what other verse in the Bible speaks towards that? Thinking of no sin, having no sin as a man, human. The one that I thought about, maybe it's not a good one. <laughs> Jesus said to him, and this was talking about the, uh, the rich young ruler, because he said, good master. And then Jesus said, no one, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. What if I say I have not sinned? What's the response? What? Yeah. But what does the verse say? It goes on for even further than that. I lie, but I also make someone else a liar. Who? God. Jesus, yeah. I make Jesus a liar. His word is not in me. Do we have any verses that you think of that, that go towards this idea that I have not sinned? Are there any verses that pop in your mind? Speaking towards the falsehood of I have not sinned, the belief. How about we are all under sin, Romans 3.9, and then Romans 3.23, it says, for all have sinned, right, and come short of the glory of God. So we are all under sin, the nature of sin. To have sin is a little bit different, is actually different than to commit sins, So to have sin speaks of the principle that lies within, of which sinful acts are a manifestation. The closer one is to the light of God, the more conscious he is of his own uncleanness and unworthiness. Those who claim to be sinless give evidence that God's truth has not penetrated their souls. Number three, What does the verse say that I confess my sins to God? What happens? What? Ah, two things. He's faithful and just to to forgive me. Cleanse, what does it say? He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. 
So he forgives us and he cleanses from all unrighteousness. That's a heart of uh, humility. I confess my sins to God, recognizing that sinful nature and our human tendencies towards error. Philippians 3, verse 12, Paul says, Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Jesus, Christ Jesus has made me His own. James 3, 2, For we all stumble in many ways. James 4, 17, Whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. So as we think about having fellowship with God, we think of God as being light. What, what, when we come to this scripture, what does it tell us about God? What do we see about the nature, the character, the attributes of God as we look back on this chapter of verses 1 through 10? What do you see it tells us about God? I'm not looking for a right or wrong answer, but I'm looking for some response. God is light. He is merciful. Mm. Amen. Amen. Good. What does God desire from us? What was that theme? That one theme word? I believe He desires fellowship with His creation. He is a holy God. So there's lots of things that we can learn from 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. But I'm going to zero in a little bit on the false teaching. That false teaching is dangerous, right? It erodes the church. We're not exempt from that, just like the church back then was not exempt from that. We can learn that darkness, as it is written here, sin, disobedience, separates us from fellowship with God because, as we heard, God is light. I would like some response and feedback from you all on some of, just think about it and I'll I'll give you an opportunity. What are some of the things that we, as you look on, see as a tendency to erode the church? And we're talking in the context of our Anabaptist churches in, in that pocket of Christianity, could I say. When we are not aware of false teachings, we can, like I said, because of the act, not because of the access, but it's very easy. We can find truth, but it's very easy to also have access to things that lead us to a different place. When we don't know the truth, we can be influenced easily. And that goes back to the question that I asked at the beginning. Have you ever heard somebody say something that didn't quite settle, but you didn't quite know what was wrong with it? What are some heresies or ideas that erode the church today? I'm going to start with one, and then I'm going to open it up. (laughs) I'm not sure if I want to start with this one, but I'm going to because I probably wrestle with this one some. I have wrestled with it in the past. Nationalism and political partisanship. (laughs) I say that on a, on a, um, a year that we have a presidential election. While we traditionally advocate, we do advocate for separation from church, state affairs and com- commitment to peace, the rising tide of nationalism and political partisanship ship, can tempt us to align more closely with political ideologies than with teachings of Christ. This can lead to justifying actions and attitudes that conflict with biblical principles of nonviolence and love for enemies. <laughs> Do you have any more ideas? Uh, 
Are we influenced by, did you have a thought? Go for it. Mm. Mm. So, yeah. So I have Jesus. I don't need you. What is that rooted in? Individuality, individualism. Yeah. Good. Mm. There again, individualism, it's rooted in individualism over community. True. We prioritize personal experience or interpretation of the scripture, personal, over communal discernment and accountability. Yeah. What else? Dane. Mm. When our emphasis is on culture and tradition over the truth. <laughs> yep. Mm. That's right. If we can focus on possessions and wealth. And that again, we, we focus on accumulation and it takes us off even community as well. So there are some roots back to individualism, materialism, consumerism. Maybe we don't wrestle with that one as much, but consumerism, we, we can have it, so we do have it. It doesn't matter. That can be a challenge for us as well. It's just a simply wasteful attitude or lifestyle. Do we, do we wrestle with relativism? <laughs> All these isms? Relativism saying there's no truth? Say that again? Yeah, yeah, yep, 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 absolutely. Me the mediaization. Is that how you said it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So sometimes it's difficult for us to hold firm biblical convictions in a society that values or seemingly the end goal is inclusivity and tolerance above truth, biblical truth. Sometimes those are actually the outcomes of something deeper that we are pursuing. But that is not the end goal. Yeah, there's a lot of others that we could talk about. Maybe it doesn't affect us as much, but we, we do hear the teaching also of you follow Christ, you're going to be wealthy, and you're going to have a good life. And that's also false. So I hope this stirs your, your mind and your thoughts to sometimes we don't always want to focus on all the things that are wrong or what are all the ideas that are coming out there towards us, but sometimes it's good to, it's good to know those, but it's important, of utmost importance to know and pursue the truth from the Word of God. So when we handle these things, when we hear them coming in, we have love. I have love for my brother, and so I am willing to actually engage with him in it. I have love for him, and so I, will, I care about him, right? So we'll have those discussions. But in the pursuit of knowing the Scripture, knowing God, knowing Christ, So when you do have a question, go to the Word. Ask your brothers, ask your sisters around you, and have some discussion about it. To learn more about who God is, His nature, and His commands for those who would follow Him through life. So 
so, pursue truth. Let's bow for prayer. Father God, we come before you, we bow. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for your sovereignty, your power, your greatness, your love. Thank you for your grace and sending your son, Jesus, who was not some lesser being to come to this earth, but he was truly God as, as human. Thank you that we have his example and his teachings to know who you are. And I ask that you will guide us into truth and that your spirit will guide us and we, we will be faithful followers and disciples serving in your kingdom, not only this week, but for our lives as this is what we've committed. Father, we ask for protection and mercy as we go from here. Help us to seek out opportunities to share your love, your light, and to expel darkness through you, through the power that, you've, that works through us, Father. I want to commit each one to you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right? Thank you so much.